that assemble like this in the daytime in a building with windows, not boarded up, not meeting in a basement somewhere. I appreciate the freedom that we have in America. I'm a veteran. I love my country. Let's establish that right off. Amen. And I am glad to be saved. A man came to the Montgomery County Jail, 1990, and gave me the truth. The Bible says in John 8, 32, and you should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And I'm glad to be free this morning. Amen. Uh, take your Bible and go to Matthew uh, 14. Matthew chapter 14. We'll visit a uh, familiar passage this morning. I've, I know your pastor. I've known him a long time. He is one of my instructors in Bible Institute as well as Brother East Depp. And... Uh, so I know that you're getting sound doctrine here. I'm not going to try to roll in here with some new great insight, some strange new doctrine. Matter of fact, anybody does, you just uh, haul them out. <laughs> Amen. Uh, we don't need something new. We need to get back into the old book. So I'm going to bring you a uh, uh, passage this morning. I feel the Lord laid on my heart for this hour, and I hope you get something from it. Maybe just another way of looking at something I'm confident you're familiar with. Amen. You ought to be. Uh, Matthew chapter 14, you've got the account, you've got the parallel passage to John chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000. All right? And uh, so then when that concludes, it said there in verse 21, and, and they that had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Uh, that's quite a bit more than 5,000. And verse 22 is where we'll pick it up. And it says this, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get in a ship, into a ship and to go before him under the other side while he sent the multitudes away. So we're going to talk about something, again, that you're familiar with. Uh, this is the passage that includes Jesus walking on the water. There's quite a bit more to it than that. And uh, so we'll try to get into that a little bit. Father, we do come to you once again in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for grace. Thank you for truth. Thank you for loving us enough to send your son. Thank you for Jesus Christ giving himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. And help us, Lord God, now in the process of purification unto himself a peculiar people. Help us to grow in grace and the knowledge. Help me to say something that will matter that the Spirit of God can bear witness to. And uh, I do love you and I thank you for the privilege to stand in this pulpit. And I pray that you bless us with your presence. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. All right, so verse 22, it says, uh, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship. They had finished with the thing, with the feeding of the uh, 5,000 men and women and children, and now they're leaving. And uh, they're, it, it says this, it said constrained. Now that word there, here's what it means. It means to urge irresistibly. Urge irresistibly, or, or maybe a word you're more familiar with would be compel. All right? Uh, you have an example of that word in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 14. It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, uh, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And indeed, we were all dead. In Ephesians 2, in trespass and sin, and Jesus Christ died for all. Salvation is available to all. The thing about it is this. It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us. Now the word constrain meaning urge, irresistibly, it means this. According to uh, verse 15, that we're no longer to live unto ourselves, but unto him that died for us. We're to do it because of the love Jesus Christ had for us, because of the love we have for him. Uh, I didn't get religion, amen. Uh, I didn't get any uh, in the last 26 years either, amen. I'm not, uh, I'm not doing what I do out of religious duty or fear. I do what I do. What are you talking about? I'm not talking about evangelism. I'm not talking about serving God. I'm talking about uh, the basics. I'm talking about reading my Bible. I'm talking about trying to abstain from all appearance of evil. I'm ta talking about the things that all Christians should do. Why? Because out of love for Jesus Christ. We never get the motive right. Amen. All right, so uh, it said, uh, straightway Jesus constrained his disciples. He urged them irresistibly to get into a ship. Now, uh, he told them exactly what to do. 
uh, get into a ship means, in the original English, get into a ship. There's no gray area. Amen. That's pretty specific. Uh, nobody could say, uh, uh, he told us to get into a wagon. <laughs> no. It, amen. He didn't say, we're leaving, we're going to the other side. And some said, well, maybe we should walk. Or maybe we should. No, he told them. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, I appreciate that the Bible is specific. I'm glad that John 14, uh, 6, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'll get there. I'm glad that in John 3, uh, the Lord told Nicodemus a couple times, he said, ye must be born again. That's how it works. And uh, I don't know how people misinterpret to this day into meaning uh, keep the commandments. <laughs> Uh, you must be born again. Uh, uh, okay, I'll, I'll be a good person and make it. Uh, no, it said you must be born again. Uh, it doesn't say uh, you must be baptized. It doesn't say you must join a church. How people get all that. And listen, there's things that aren't bad in and of themselves unless you think that's going to get you up there. It's not going to do it. He is very specific uh, when he says uh, he, he constrained his disciples to get in to a ship. And again, now John 14, 6, when he said, I am the way, the way, you hear me, the truth and the life. Amen. That's pretty clear, pretty specific. And then I noticed that he adds for uh, knuckleheads like me, and you know, maybe you, he adds this phrase at the end of the verse. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Listen, I made so many bad decisions in the first 37 years of my life and a few after. But if, if salvation uh, could have been multiple choice, based on my track record, I'd have got it wrong. But it's not multiple choice. There's one choice, and it's him. I am the way, the truth, the life. I appreciate the Bible being clear and specific. Uh, the hope that I have uh, is coming back to get me. It's not the hope as in, I hope I get there. I know I'm going to get there. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That's what I'm looking for. How about you? All right, so uh, in no uncertain terms, Christ told the disciples in this verse to get into a ship. And I, I want to say to you this. We need to get into a ship too. Uh, I remember... Uh, uh, Buddy Blunkoff singing at the camp meetings uh, years ago uh, that uh, song, Ship Ahoy. Wasn't that good? Listen, there's a ship, me and you better be on board. It's called the old Ship of Zion. Uh, its proper name would be uh, the HMS, His Majesty's Ship, uh, the HMS Faith. The Bible says in Ephesians uh, chapter 2 and verse number 8, For by grace he is saved through faith. And that, and boy, it doesn't stop there, does it? Uh, uh, talk about no gray area. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And not of works, lest any man should boast. I appreciate, uh, amen. If the Bible can be that specific, even old idiots like me can get saved. And you too. Amen. amen. I appreciate that. And, uh, but I want to say something about this old, old ship of Zion. It's not a cruise ship. Uh, don't waste your time looking for the shuffleboard court. I hope I never get old enough where shuffleboard makes a lick of sense to me. Yeah, amen. Uh, uh, but there's, I don't go on cruises. I got no interest in that. Amen. But I just want to say, uh, uh, the old ship of Zion, uh, there's no lounge chairs on the deck. There's no swimming pools. And uh, 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 there's no endless buffets. And don't try to tweak the marriage supper of the lamb to fit there. Amen. You ain't going to be hungry after the judgment seat of Christ. You hear what I'm saying? Oh, what strange new doctrine is that? It's the forgotten doctrine of the Bible believer, the judgment seat of Christ. I'm going to tell you something. This old ship of Zion I'm talking about that you and me better be on board with, it isn't a cruise ship. It's a warship. And it's sailing through enemy waters. And it's got a mission. And it's a search and rescue mission. That's what it is. All right, so he told him exactly what to do, and then he told him exactly where to go. In the verse, it said, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent, his, while he sent the multitudes away. 
he told him to go under the other side. And uh, it was a destination, a specific destination. They're on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, there's a passage in Mark chapter 4. Uh, it took place before this. Uh, and uh, it said in verse 35, In the same day when even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. Uh, he didn't say either time, uh, let's see if we can make it. <laughs> let's make that our goal and shoot for it. No, he said it matter-of-factly, uh, as could be, let us uh, pass over onto the other side. Uh, religion says, do your best, maybe you'll make it. But that's not what God says. You know what God says? He says, get on board. <laughs> that's what we need to do. He said, get on board. I'll make sure you make it. Amen. Amen. Like I said, after a lot of wrong decisions, I made one right one day, amen, that got me passage on the right ship, amen. If you're saved, so did you. All right, so, uh, you know, and he told them uh, what to do, and he does us, and he told them where to go, and he does us too. Uh, it says in Luke 14, 23, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled there you go compel constrain uh these are words that are connected to compassionately uh urging <laughs> amen that's what we're supposed to be doing now something else in verse 22 uh and straightway jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go bef before him to go before him you know what he's telling him? he says you do this i'll be along a little later and he had business to it why well because he had business to attend to and it wasn't a secret, all right? No, no, no backroom meetings, all right? Uh, nothing, uh, nothing uh, hidden. Uh, he told him exactly what his business was right there in the verse. While he sent the multitudes away. Amen. Uh, he had something very important to attend to. Uh, he didn't delegate that job uh, to one of the disciples. He didn't delegate it to an associate or a deacon or a committee. Amen. Let me tell you why. Because the Lord, aren't you glad that the Lord is personally interested, personally interested in the affairs of people? Uh, I find that uh, uh, to come out in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, where Peter said, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Uh, Psalm 8, verse 4 says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? I ask myself that all the time. Why would God even give us the time of day? And, uh, you know, I can explain that theologically, and I can go, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't know what it is he sees in us, but I'm sure glad that he sees something in us. I'm glad that our relationship with our Savior is real. It's not some lofty religious thing. I'm telling you, I'm glad. Lord, I talked to him a little while ago. I'm so glad I can do that. Amen. Amen. He's personally interested. I'll tell you how interested the Lord is in people. He even made time for people that didn't like him. Yeah. And give you an example. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. O generation of vipers, uh, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak us. Wow. Jesus is so fair. He even talked to the people that were plotting to kill him. Verse 23. Verse 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And the even, evening was come, and he was, uh, he was there alone. All right? So uh, uh, he sent the disciples. Uh, uh, he told them what to do. He told them where, where to go. Uh, he told them what he was going to be doing until he joined them. And then in verse 23, it tells us what he was doing. He went up into a mountain apart to pray. He sent the multitude away, just like he said. And then he went up there to pray. It wasn't me time. It wasn't... Man, I've been at it, hot and heavy for a while. I need to be alone. No, it was, it was, it wasn't texting time. It wasn't time to catch up on his emails or the latest news. It wasn't that. It's very. It wasn't Twitter time. I don't even like that word. <laughs> Somebody said, "Brother Virgin, do you tweet?" I said, "I'll slap you if you say that to me again." <laughs> no, I didn't say that. 
I just, I can't get a hold, some of this stuff I can't get a hold of, and, and mostly because I'm not trying at all, amen. <laughs> if you do, that's your business. He went up into a, mar- uh, a mountain apart to pray, it was praying time. It was time even for the Lord to be alone with God. And I'll tell you what, uh, I don't know why we would ever get the impression that that's less important now than it was then. It's more important than ever, and it is more lacking than ever. Now, here's uh, here's what I say to myself, and I'm going to say it to you. Turn it off. Turn it off more often, whatever it is, whether it's a computer, whether it's a tablet, whether it's a television, whether it's your phone. Turn that thing off. Oh, I, I turn mine on. I put it on vibrate while I'm in church. You know, I leave mine in the car. Uh, my friends know I'm in church. I'm not expecting a call. And I doubt if it's going to be so important, I need to get it here. Uh, okay, here we go. There's exceptions. One of my kids is sick. One of my kids is on the road. My wife, she'll sit in the back row with her phone on vibrate. But let me tell you about some of you people that are just... Uh, bound and determined you think you're so important that at any second the the president might tweet you (laughs) and uh and so i sit here and i watch congregation every week and people be sitting there and all of a sudden you know they start vibrating people around them see it yeah i mean you might as well have it on amen i just want to say to you if if it was important enough that jesus christ took time to pray and it was important enough for it to be put in the Bible for us 2,000 years later that Jesus Christ took time to pray. Uh, The reason for that is not just all good reading. It's to tell us that it's important to take time to pray. And uh, boy, aren't aren't we in a time, we know where we are, we're in the devil's world, he's the God of this world, uh, where we are wired. Amen. To stay too busy for God. We're, we're, we're to the point where we think, I mean, if we can tear ourselves away from this world and not just cares, not just affairs and cares are different. This world is wired to keep us so busy that even if we go to church faithfully, even if we go to outreach, even if we read our Bible a little bit, you know, Proverbs Day, you know, keeps, I don't know what away. Um, but we what goes by the wayside is sincere time of prayer. It does me. I'm busy. I'm too busy. Amen? We're all too busy. Every American lives life in the fast lane, not just old bikers. Amen? All right. Now, verse 24. Uh, but the ship, now that's, you know what that is. That's the ship he sent them onto. Uh, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea. So they made it halfway across in the midst. They made it about three, <coughs> almost, four, almost four miles out in the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus was doing all that. And, uh, and, but, now, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, there's a storm. And uh, this storm has got them stuck in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Four of these guys are professional fishermen, and that's their home water. I can imagine the non-sailors were probably, you know what they were doing, overboard, chumming, as someone called it once. Uh, uh, Even the four experienced fishermen are in fear of their lives. Amen. Same thing in Mark chapter 4. Storms rise up. I grew up off Lake Erie, and I'll tell you what, that's the most treacherous lake of all the Great Lakes because uh, of its depth and the way the wind comes across. Uh, it gets crazy fast. And it looks like Sea of Galilee is that way too. These, this ship is now in the midst of the sea, and they can't do anything about it. Uh, they, there's no way out. And uh, I want you to notice that it appears to me they were also in the exact center of the will of God because he sent them out there. I mean, they're exactly where the Lord told them to be, and now uh, the ship uh, it said uh, it was tossed with waves, and the winds were contrary. And these are sailboats, friends. Now, this boat, they can't navigate this thing. They're at the mercy of the storm. And again, let me say they were in the center 
of the will of God. I mean, you know that Jesus knew the wind was going to become contrary when he sent them. Uh, no storm. I'll tell you what, I've had some things blindside me. I mean, since I was saved. I mean, there's been things that have come along that I never saw coming, I would have never imagined. Hey, Amen. Have you been saved any time at all? Uh, same things happen to you. But I want you to know that no storm ever took Jesus Christ by surprise. Amen. And that's where our confidence has got to lie. Amen. In the master of the sea. I, 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 I'll say it like that. Uh, Jesus Christ, even though they were worried, he wasn't worried. He knew they were going to make it because he was going to make sure they made it. The same goes for you and I. There's oftentimes circumstances, situations we find ourselves in the middle of. Uh, we need to get our eyes back on the master. Amen. And just realize we're going to navigate through this one way or another. Might not be smooth sailing. He never promised anybody smooth sailing. On the contrary. The Bible's pretty clear about letting us know there's going to be some rough seas. And uh, we need them. We need those storms. We don't like them. I don't like them. I don't like them. I like when things just go smooth. I do. And uh, sometimes they do. But we need controversy. We need storms. That's where we're humbled. And that's a good thing. And even better than that, that's where we draw nigh to God. And that's a very good thing. And we really need that. Storms of life have specific purposes. Sometimes they're for correcting. Sometimes they're for correcting. Uh, Jonah chapter 1 and verse 4, But the Lord uh, sent out a great wind into the sea, for there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Pretty serious storm at sea. Jonah was heading 180 degrees away from the will of God. And that mighty tempest, that storm right there, put the brakes on that, didn't it? And the uh, Lord sent a storm there in Jonah's life. Uh, I mean, he was ready. He, he said, throw me overboard. I mean, it was going to be death. Amen? But the Lord had something else in mind. The Lord had to correct his way of thinking. And it didn't even matter much that he uh, never appreciated it, really, and came out with a rotten attitude when it was over, as long as he did, the Lord's will was accomplished, and then he did what the Lord, what a crying shame it is to see God do a couple miracles like that and still have a bad attitude. I think Jonah might have been where the Baptist church started. I'm not sure. I'm not doing a message on that today. Amen. But uh, I'm here to tell you some storms are for correcting, and some are for selecting. Selecting. Uh, let me give you a verse. First uh, Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. We need trials. That's where they, we get tested. That's where we get prepared for spiritual confrontation, temptation, and challenge. Amen. And God will use a storm to separate the men from the boys and the ladies from the girls. Amen. And he used to do that through heart. It's easy when everything's smooth sailing to say, sir, yes, sir. But I'll tell you what, when it gets rough, that's when we find out what people are made out of. And some storms are for, elect, for selecting. I read a verse in Arkansas last Sunday, and I, I think it's Jeremiah 17, 9. I'm not going to go there. But it said this, basically, uh, uh, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, uh, how shalt thou contend with horses? Remember, the horse is prepared against the day of battle. And, and if in the land of peace, wherein thou trusted, they have weary thee. How shall thou do in the swelling of Jordan? I guess I did remember it. That struck home with me real tough. I'm going to tell you what. You're wearied. You're out. Don't get out. The Lord's with you. Amen. Whatever seems like the biggest deal in the world right now, there's probably something bigger down the pike. So buckle up. Amen. Might as well face it head on. I tell you what, I don't intend in this battle. I don't intend to get shot in the bat. <laughs> Just shoot me in the face. I hope to stay face toward the battle. Amen. You ought to feel that way. And some storms are for correcting, and some are for selecting, and some are for perfecting. Uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulation also. Uh, let me say again, that's high ground. Right there. I mean, I've been through some things, so have you. 
And I've seen some Christians weather unbelievable storms. But truth be known, I know we can get, uh, God will get us through, but truth be known, I like smooth sailing. Tribulation worketh patience. Uh, uh, well, let me say this. We glory in tribulation, Paul wrote to him. I'm going, boy. And he, at least he gave a reason. Uh, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Okay, patience. I, you've been, I'm 64. I got news for you. Uh, I, brother, sister, Estep can attest to this. I got a lot more patience than I had 25 years ago. I'm learning it. So where do you learn it? By going through stuff. That's where it comes from. And patience experience. Where does experience come from? By learning patience from going through stuff. Amen. And if you ever make it, uh, then you find uh, uh, experience uh, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And I'll tell you what this world needs, same thing you needed, uh, hope. And uh, people out, you know what? Uh, people are looking for something real. I spent all them years in them motorcycle gangs. I wasn't trying to be on the FBI's most wanted list. I just was looking for something worth living for. I was looking for something real. And the devil knows that's what people want. And that's why there's so many counterfeits. And whether it's organizations and cliques or clubs or cults, the devil's got plenty of distractions. But at the end of the day, you know what people want? People want something real. They've been lied to by politics and religion and Hollywood for so long. They're to the point where they're skeptical. They don't believe anything's real. And I'm going to tell you what, Jesus Christ is the realest thing there ever was. Amen. And you know that uh, to be true. And it says, uh, thanks five, uh, First Peter 3, I think it's 3, 15, but thanks five, the Lord God in your heart to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks the reason of you reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And listen, this isn't about us, man. It's about people driving up and down Kinsey Road uh, right now that aren't in church anywhere and they're going to end up in the wrong place if they don't see somebody along the way that this book's real to. Because we're their only hope. Amen. And if I had a question to ask the Lord when I get there, it'd be, why did you leave such an important commission in the hands of people like us? And he knows the answer, and I'm sure I won't need to ask him anything. I'll know what I need to know. But that's the way I look at it. What an important thing. We ought to take it more seriously than we do. That's a good place for an amen. Amen. All right. I'll amen myself. I'm in evangelism, so I've learned to do that. <coughs> verse 25. Let's go to verse 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, uh, Jesus walked unto them walking Jesus went unto them walking on the water. Fourth watch. That's between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. That means it's dark. Very dark. It said in John 6, it was now dark. Uh, amen. Aren't storms always more ominous? I mean, you ever been in a real bad thunderstorm in the daytime and you're looking out and it's raining and you're seeing the winds blowing the trees and all that. Then you have the same storm in the middle of the night. And you don't know what's going on. You get a flash of lightning and the trees will be bowed over. Aren't storms always more ominous when it's dark? I'm going to tell you what, when this is going on right here, when the Jesus is walking on the water, when he gets out there to them, according to John's gospel, it's dark. And, uh, and he said in verse 19, well, verse 18 there, and John had said, and the sea arose by reason of the great wind. I was out on a boat. I don't even know why I was on a boat. I was on a boat on the Nepali coast out of Kauai, Hawaii, I was out there preaching, and we're on a boat ride that somebody paid for. And I know I sound unappreciative. The Lord smite my heart over that. I am sick. I'm seasick. I'm puking. And I'm thinking, I'm not puking, but I was afraid I would. Was that okay to say that? Strike that from the tape. Okay. And, uh, and I'm thinking, I am the toughest. There's no doubt in my mind, I'm the toughest guy on this ship. And I'm going to be the only one throwing up on deck. And they're all going to laugh, and I'm going to be mad. And so we're looking, for, we're looking for whales. There's a whale, there's a spout a mile out. And everybody on the whole ship is over there. And they're, they're like, oh, maybe we'll, my wife too. We're going to spot a whale. And I'm on the back side of the boat. I can care less about whales. I'm trying not to lose my lunch. And while I'm sitting back there, I'm going to tell you what God did. I mean, 25 yards off the stern of that ship, a whale came up and that tail thing like, 
You know, some of you see on movies, that tail came up and ran, and everybody on that boat missed it because they're looking for a spout a mile away, and I'm going to go, ooh, oh, ooh, wow, God <laughs> just did that for me in the middle of the storm. I never did throw up. I was so happy to be saved. Amen. I was so happy to know Jesus Christ, even when the storm arose. But just to get back to reality, that's not fun. Amen. And that's what's going on here. The sea arose. And John 6, 19, it says, so when they had rowed, this is a sailboat, you understand? When they had rowed, <laughs> we're talking emergency measures, <laughs> uh, about tw five and 20 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea. A furlong is 660 feet. Uh, they were between three and three and three quarter miles out. They've been rowing in a storm. Talk about a workout. Uh, they didn't get out there on smooth seas. You hear me? In fact, in Mark's uh, account of this, it says, and Jesus saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary. They were fighting for their very lives in the middle of a storm that Jesus Christ himself sent them into. Here now, knowing people, uh, I, I would think that they're probably wondering where he was when they needed him. Yeah. That's the way people are. I mean, after all, uh, they'd seen him do all kinds of things. All kinds of things. Even at this point, by Matthew 14, they'd seen him do all kinds of things for other people. It says in Matthew 11, the blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them, and the Lord is doing all this kind of thing, and now his 12 disciples are out there in the middle of that sea fighting for their lives. In the middle of God's will. Amen. Verse 29. Verse 29, for, for sake of time. And he said, he got to him. Now, well, maybe I should read it. Um, 26, and the disciples saw him walking on the sea, and they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. For they cried out for fear, and straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Peter answered and said, Lord, if it be thou, uh, bid me come unto thee on the water. Remember, these are Jews. Uh, these are Jews. Jews require a sign. It, it wasn't a sign of lack of Peter's faith to ask for proof. Uh, that's just how they were. Uh, that's not how we're supposed to be. Uh, the Greeks seek us after wisdom. Amen. We're supposed to believe what God told us. Amen. But Peter, uh, he threw that out there. And uh, verse 29, and he said, the Lord, he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water. Uh, to go to Jesus. Amen. And everybody's familiar uh, with uh, uh, Peter, was uh, the only other man in history that I know of that walked on the water. And I'll give him credit because even after he got out of the boat and was walking on the water, none of the others tried it. None of, none of the others were even tempted to try it. Uh, amen. They were just content to sit in the boat and, and see this guy out there step out by faith. And it's looking good. It's going good. And I want you to notice also, and maybe the most important thing in the whole passage is uh, uh, at the end of the verse, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. That was the reason he's out there. That's the ticket right there. You know, uh, some of us long for our disappearing. You know, the times and the world scenario and the po some of us long for our disappearing. I've prayed it myself. I don't have one problem outside of the judgment seat that the rapture wouldn't take care of. Amen. I want to say it again. Some of us long for our disappearing more than we long or love his appearing. Some of us are more focused on a mansion in heaven or all the sights that we behold than we are Jesus Christ. Christ himself. It is significant to me that the passage states that Peter stepped out of that boat not to get his name in history, but to go to Jesus. Would to God we could get a hold of the importance of going to Jesus. Verse 30. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Just like we do. We step out by faith. Amen. But buddy, I'm going to tell you what. You, we get our eyes off the Lord. And it's, the storm is raging all around us. Amen. 
and uh, we'll do just like him. We'll begin to sink. And Peter gives us the right model to follow. He cried out, uh, Lord, save me. Uh, not after he was uh, down, gone down once and gone down twice and going down for the third time with a mouth full of lungs full of seawater and stressing his family and his church and everybody out. Finally, after a, a, every method of his own expiring and failing, he didn't cry out, Lord, save me. That's what we do sometimes. This is significant to say, beginning to sink. As soon as he realized there was a problem, he went to the right source right away, cried out, uh, Lord, save me. You know what some people I know would do? They'd have called, if they'd have been Peter, they would have turned and called out to their buddies in the boat. Throw me a life preserver. Amen. Or, or even worse, maybe they would have, well, I'm beginning to sing. See you later, Jesus, and start trying to swim back to the boat. That's what we do. We lean on our own understanding. We try to figure it out, and then we go to Jesus Christ as a last resort. That Bible says, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. And if you're saved, man, you're a child of God, Jesus Christ should be your first resort. And that's what the passage shows me. And I think it's uh, valid because verse 31 says, immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. Notice this. Peter's still out, still out there on the water, and the storm is still raging, but he's not sinking anymore because the Lord's right there with him and so it is with you and I the storms are raging but uh, the Bible says he'll never leave you he'll never forsake you amen uh, and then the Lord said this to him and said unto him oh thou little faith wherefore did thou doubt uh, I don't think Peter was offended by the Lord saying that I don't think he minded the rebuke well, I know some Christians that will not will not take a reproof let alone a rebuke uh, my bible says in proverbs chapter 6 reproofs of instruction are the way of life but i'm gonna say it again i know people that cannot be reproved who do you think you are that's the spirit sometimes that's the actual words that come out of their mouth i guess sometimes depending on where the advice is coming from or the reproof it says preach the word begins and in season out of season reprove rebuke and exhort all along suffering and doctrine i guess there's a time and a point where if you can't take a reproof from the right person you're really saying i'm not taking a reproof from god amen that's good teaching am i teaching is that what this is amen, amen. here's something else peter didn't do uh when the lord said uh uh, uh what did he say oh thou of little faith wherefore did not he didn't defend himself said well at least lord i tried none of the others tried that's what we do we go into defense mode right away Instead of just being so glad that Jesus Christ came to our rescue, we still can't get our eyes back on him, and we got it on everything else, and here's how, you know, we play the victim card. I, that, that offends me. The Americans uh, becoming victims offends me. But, okay, it is what it is. But this Christians... Born again, eternally secure, King James Bible-believing Christians all over this land that are just bound and determined to say, oh, woe is me, and they're nothing. I can't get that. I don't want that. My Bible says, but thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's too many victims out there. Amen. You're spending more time thinking about talking about yourself than you are talking to God. Amen. That is, hold on. Good teaching, Brother Spurt. This is neat, blue, yeah, okay. Okay, um, all right, you got to learn to do that when you're in evangelism these days. Used to be a time people would, re okay. All right, now, let me see. I'm almost done. You know when evangelist says that, it doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> Verse 32, and when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. And not before. Like I said, Peter, well, they were still in the storm when, Peter was out there in the Lord's embrace. Uh, uh, so the storm ceased when they got in the boat. And you know why? You know why? Yeah, I mean, as soon as they stepped on the boat, the wind ceased. You know why? Because the wind already knew what to do. I mean, Jesus didn't even have to say anything. He had rebuked the wind in Mark chapter 4. He said, peace be still. And the wind, and all this is going on. And as soon as he got back in the boat, he said, oh, okay, boys, that's it. We know what to do. Now let's not get, did you get that? Some of you are looking at me like you didn't get it. 
It's only when my wife does that I worry. Amen. All right. Something else happened when Jesus got on board. Don't worry. The donuts will be there for you. Amen. Uh, John chapter 6, 21, it said, Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately, immediately, they're in the midst of Galilee. That's eight miles wide, 13 miles long, and they're in the middle of that sea. And as soon as Jesus, it says, they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at land. Um, you know what, that sailboat, that fishing boat, when Jesus got on board, became a power boat. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it made that distance. Let me tell you something. If you're lacking power in your life over sin, you're lacking power to do right. You're lacking power to want to do right. Man, could I suggest making sure Jesus is on board? Because he's in. You'll have the power you need. Uh, it says, uh, uh, but to as many as received him, then gave me power to become the sons of God, even unto them that believe on his name. John chapter 1 and verse 12. And what do you think that power is for? Why would Jesus Christ give you and me power? He'd give us the power to do right. He'd give us the power to live for God. He'd give us the power to make a difference in lost and done well. He'd give us the power to, it's not the power to do whatever you want. That's what lost people do. <laughs> That's what too many Christians do, whatever they want. I'll tell you what, you get Jesus Christ on board and you'll have the power to do what he wants you to do. It won't be such a struggle. I know the flesh lusts us against the spirit. I get that. But why does the flesh win as often as it does? Amen? All right, I'm almost done for real, maybe. Uh, verse 33, Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. And that's how they showed their gratitude for calming the storm and for getting them to the other side. They worshiped him, and so should we. Uh, we should show our, our gratitude by worshiping him out of love and out of gratitude. Father, thank you for this hour. I pray that something was said might be a help, blessing, according to thy will. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. See, once I get in the teaching hour, I never ask, what time do you want me to be done? See, that way I don't, I didn't stand by. Okay, please stand. Let's have a couple ushers. We're going to have, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, then, tell them what to do, Pastor. There you go. <laughs> They're saying, where did you get this guy? <laughs>